It's the real news. I'm Aaron Maté. When it comes to Israel-Palestine, there is a broad international consensus about the minimum condition for peace. An Israeli withdrawal from the occupied territories of the West Bank and Gaza, which it conquered in 1967, as well as a just resolution to the refugee problem Israel created in 1948, when it expelled hundreds of thousands of Palestinians from their homes. But within that consensus, there is a lot of difference of opinion on how all that can be achieved. Well, a new book seeks to bridge the divide by bringing together dozens of prominent voices, Palestinians, Israelis, and others, activists, politicians, and professors. It is organized according to 15 big questions about the future of Israel-Palestine. The book is called Moment of Truth, Tackling Israel-Palestine's Toughest Questions. Jamie Stern Beiner is the book's editor and a graduate student at the University of Oxford. Welcome, Jamie. First, explain to us just what you set out to uh, achieve with this book um, and how you came to uh, organize it and bring together uh, this uh, diverse range of voices. Well, the book's title, Moment of Truth, was reflected in part to, uh, intended in part to reflect a growing sense among Palestinians, among their supporters, and among observers of the conflict more generally that more than a century into the conflict, more than a half century into Israel's military occupation of the Palestinian territories, and more than 10 years into Israel's brutal, illegal, and immoral siege of Gaza, there's this growing sense that the Palestinians' long quest, long struggle for self-determination has reached an impasse, if not a dead end. This sense refers both to the means by which the Palestinian leadership has tended to prosecute their struggle, so you might say at one pole, armed struggle, and at the other pole, international diplomacy, these means are now widely viewed to have been exhausted. More fundamentally still, the very objective or political vision to which the Palestinian struggle has been oriented since at least the late 1980s namely an independent Palestinian state uh, in the context of a two-state solution, that very framework is now increasingly viewed to have passed its sell-by date. The book is intended to use uh, the series of rather grim milestones that we recently passed, notably the 50th anniversary of Israel's occupation uh, in June 2017, to use those occasions to take stock, to soberly assess and reassess the situation on the ground, to learn from decades of what have mostly been failures and false starts, and to consider in a non-sloganeering, factually informed way just what is and what is not possible in Palestine going forward. Okay, so let's talk about that because one of the key questions for people who are thinking about what the solution could be is whether or not, putting aside whether or not a two-state solution is legitimate, because there are many on the Palestinian side who at this point are say that they, that they just demand simple equality, that similar to apartheid South Africa, they want equality and democracy in all of Israel and Palestine uh, with no privileging of Jewish rights in a Jewish-only state. So putting that one aside, though, um, one argument against the two-state solution, aside from, its, aside from just wanting basic democracy and equality, is that the settlements in the, in the occupied West Bank have made a two-state solution impossible. And in Chapter 3 of your book, you have a pretty lively debate about that. Uh, can, you, can you summarize just the, the main arguments on either side and your takeaway from it? Right. So as you say, the settlements are commonly cited as an obstacle, perhaps the paramount obstacle uh, to a two-state solution, uh, and even as proof positive that two states is now dead. Uh, it's commonly thought that Israel's illegal settlements now take up or consume so much of the West Bank that there's no space physically left uh, on which to establish a viable Palestinian state. It's also, and relatedly, commonly thought that a viable two-state solution would require that Israel evacuate every last one of its approximately 600,000 uh, illegal settlers. Chapter 3 of the book, which is, in my opinion, its most important, 
features an exchange between Shaul Ariely and Yan de Jong, expert advisors on the settlements issue to successive Israeli and Palestinian negotiating teams, respectively. And in my view, that exchange refutes both these premises. So, as a preliminary point, the vast majority of Israel's settlers are in fact concentrated in a handful of large settlements which are located close to the pre-June 1967 border, also known as the Green Line. These settlement blocks, as they are sometimes called, take up just 4-5% to of the occupied Palestinian territory. Now in the book, Ariely argues that a reciprocal exchange of territory between Israel and Palestine, the future state of Palestine, amounting to about 3 to 4% of the occupied Palestinian territory, would permit the establishment of a Palestinian state on territory equivalent in size to 100% of the West Bank and Gaza, while enabling Israel to annex fully four-fifths, 80% of its settlers, thereby, of course, uh, radically reducing the political cost uh, of a two-state solution. Now, uh, Yan de Jong writes uh, in opposition to Ariely's proposal. He makes the point, and I think this is a very important point that listeners. And Yan de Jong, just to explain, is a, is a former advisor to the Palestinian uh, negotiating team. Absolutely. He's a Dutch cartographer who's a recognized expert on these issues, and he advised um, Palestinian negotiating teams on them. Um, he makes an important point, which is too often forgotten in discussions about land swaps and potential territorial exchanges, namely that what matters isn't just the percentage. What matters is the implications, the consequences of particular territorial exchanges for Palestinian self-determination. So to take an obvious example, East Jerusalem comprises less than 1% of occupied Palestinian territory and yet a Palestinian state would be inconceivable without it. So when assessing potential um, proposals for a land swap, one has to examine not just the quantity of territory, but the quality, its location, um, its uh, fertility in terms of its resources, and other, other factors. Now in the book, de Jong mounts a critique of Ariely's proposal. Um, he believes that any land swap of above 2%, uh, of the occupied Palestinian territory, which is a figure that the Palestinian negotiating team offered to Israel um, in the course of the 2008 Annapolis talks. He argues that any land swap above that figure would severely and perhaps fatally undermine Palestinian contiguity and socioeconomic viability. So taking that exchange as a whole, we can say that establishing a viable and contiguous Palestinian state would require the evacuation of Israeli settlers from all but 2 to 4% of the West Bank. Uh, in such a scenario, between 125,000, if we take Ariadi's proposal, and about 250,000, if we take de Jong's proposal, um, illegal Israeli settlers would have to be uprooted. Uh, now, that's still a formidable obstacle. Uh, no mistake about it. Uh, but if few Israelis would now support such a move, that might simply reflect the fact that currently there is no Palestinian movement capable of imposing significant costs on Israel uh, for continuing the occupation. Right. And, you know, my issue with the land swaps has always been is that it's not the only option. I mean, as you say, those settlers could be uprooted um, if not, but the reason that they're not right now is there's no sufficient political pressure on them to do that. But of course, if U.S. opinion especially was mobilized and changed, uh, it would be more difficult to keep the settlers there because without Israeli, uh, without U.S. support, it's difficult for Israel to do what it does. And I think it's Noam Chomsky who has said that, well, if w the world community could force uh, the an Israeli withdrawal from the occupied territories, the settlers would have no one there to protect them. And so whoever doesn't want to live in a Palestinian state could simply leave. And there's no reason to grant, I guess, people who don't have a legal right to be somewhere any legitimacy, any, any credence in evaluating whether or not it's feasible to keep them there or not. I agree. The law is clear. The Israeli settlers are all illegal 
They're there illegally. The settlements were established in contravention of international law, of the Fourth Geneva Convention. And under international law, it's very clear they have to be withdrawn. The question um, which remains is political. Yeah. Namely, is there a scenario in which um, sufficient political pressure might be brought to bear on Israel uh, to induce it to undertake such a withdrawal? Now, the more uh, the greater the number of settlers Israel has to evacuate, then the higher, the, the greater the amount of political pressure required uh, on it to persuade it to uh, to evacuate them. Right. Uh, so, I think okay. what... Mm. Yeah. So, so, I think, so, I, so yes. Yeah. I go ahead, sorry. Sorry. Uh, so just to finish that thought, I think what the book makes clear, or what that chapter makes clear, is two things. Number one, the common view of the settlements as posing a physical, a decisive physical obstacle to the realization of a two-state solution, it's false. Uh, the obstacle is political. It's a question of political will. That's the first point. The second point is, it's not the case that in order for there to be a viable Palestinian state established, every last one of Israel's illegal settlements will have to be removed. If Israel were to be induced to make Palestinians an offer along the lines they have that the Palestinian negotiating team has offered in the past, it could still allow for a contiguous and socioeconomic viable Palestinian state. All right. So one obstacle that is commonly cited uh, as uh, as impeding the chances of, uh, of peace in a two-state solution uh, is Hamas. Uh, we're often told that Hamas uh, cannot be a partner for peace because of its charter. Um, you tackle this in the book uh, with a chapter on whether Hamas can be a part of the solution. Can you talk about the debate there and, again, your, your takeaway from it? So uh, that chapter opens with a back-and-forth debate between uh, Nathan Thrall, who is an expert on the Israel-Palestine conflict with the International Crisis Group, and Gaith Abu Ahad, who, uh, Gaith Alamari, excuse me, um, who um, is a former advisor to the Palestinian Authority, uh, Gaith makes the case that Hamas cannot be part of the solution uh, because of, firstly, its commitment to uh, violence, or at any rate, its refusal to renounce violence as a means of continuing the struggle. As opposed to um, who? As opposed to Israel or the U.S., who certainly will not refuse to renounce violence? <laughs> well, that's, a, that's certainly a good counter-argument. And, yeah, um, yeah. and, it, and it's one that is made in, in the chapter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Gaith also argues that Hamas's um, refusal to clearly endorse um, Israel's right to exist, a two-state solution, in other words, renders it, for now, at least until it reverses that position, uh, an obstacle rather than a partner or even a potential partner um, to efforts to resolve the conflict on that basis. Uh, now, against him, Nathan Thrall firstly points to the double standards which you've just alluded to, namely that if Hamas is allegedly um, uh, has allegedly failed to sufficiently recognize Israel, uh, it's also the case that uh, not a single Israeli government uh, since 1967. In fact, not a single mainstream Israeli political party has recognized the right of a Palestinian state to exist on the territory allocated to it under international law. And in fact, of course, its repudiation of the law on this point is not merely rhetorical. Uh, it guides Israeli policy on the ground. Um, Thorl also points out that recognition comes in different forms. It's one thing to demand a state, that a state of Palestine recognize um, the state of Israel, uh, just as other states recognize um, each other all the time. It's another to demand that Hamas as an organization, as a party, um, recognize Israel. Israeli political parties, such as the Likud party, their positions as parties um, are certainly uh, in contravention of um, treaties. I mean, uh, the, Likud part, the, the Likud manifesto, I believe, is still committed to 
um, establishing greater Israel over the whole territory. That's um, right. It says it says no uh, additional Palestinian state uh, west of Jordan, basically implying that Jordan already has a Palestinian state, which basically means no Palestinian state. Absolutely. Um, but there's a distinction between uh, the position of a, of a political party and the position of a government. Uh, so, for example, if a state of Palestine were to uh, agree uh, on the two-state framework with Israel and enter into a treaty on that basis, that should be sufficient. What Hamas personally views, it's a it's personal opinion, um, as expressed in its own charter and so forth, shouldn't necessarily be the decisive issue. Um, Gaith uh, Alomari, in his contribution, uh, cites the precedent of the PLO. He said, and he, he intends this as a positive pre precedent that ought to be followed in the case of Hamas, he recalls that the international community refused to engage diplomatically with the PLO and to in include it in diplomatic efforts to resolve the conflict until it accepted international conditions, namely renunciation of violence or terrorism uh, and recognition of Israel. However, respondents to the debate, so I should clarify, the chapter uh, opens with this back and forth debate, uh, but then this, uh, that exchange is followed by three further commentaries on that, uh, on that uh, debate. Um, Khaled Hrub, who's an academic authority on Hamas, he points out that to cite the precedent of the PLO is hardly, uh, would hardly persuade Hamas to follow suit. I mean, what happened with the PLO is that it bent to international pressure. It uh, did all that was required of it in terms of uh, recognizing Israel, renouncing violence and so forth. And what did it get? 600,000 Israeli settlers on the West Bank a near doubling of the, settlement, of the settler population uh, in the decade following the signing of the first uh, Oslo Accord in 1993. So that's hardly an encouraging precedent for Hamas to follow. The book is called Moment of Truth, Tackling Israel-Palestine's Toughest Questions. Jamie Stern-Viner, thank you. Many thanks. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.